The Lord uh, then recruited and deployed 70 more disciples, and he sent them ahead in teams of two to visit all the towns and settlements between them and Jerusalem, and this is what he ordered. He said, there's a great harvest waiting in the fields, but there aren't many good workers to harvest it. Pray that the harvest master will send out good workers to the fields. It's time for you 70 to go. I'm sending you out armed with vulnerability like lambs walking into a pack of wolves. Don't bring a wallet. Don't carry a backpack. Don't, I don't even want you to wear sandals. Walk along barefooted, quietly, without stopping for small talk. When you enter a house seeking lodging, say, peace on this house. And if a child of peace, one who welcomes God's message of peace, is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, don't worry. Nothing is wasted. Stay where you're welcome. Be a part of the family, eating and drinking whatever they give you. You're my workers, and you deserve to be cared for. Again, don't go from house to house, but settle in a town and eat whatever they serve you. Heal the sick and say to the townspeople, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Of course, not every town will welcome you, and if you're rejected, walk through the streets and say, we're leaving this town, we'll wipe off the dust that clings to our feet and protest against you, but even so, know this, the kingdom of God has come near. Listen, disciples, if people give you a hearing, they're giving me a hearing. If they reject you, they're rejecting me. And if they reject me, they're rejecting the one who sent me. So go now. When the 70 completed their mission and returned to report on their experiences, they were elated. The 70 said, it's amazing, Lord, when we use your name, the demons do what we say. And Jesus said, I know. I saw Satan falling from above like a lightning bolt. I've given you true authority. You can smash vipers and scorpions under your feet. You can walk all over the power of the enemy. You can't be harmed. But listen, that's not the point. Don't be elated that evil spirits leave when you say to leave. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you. And I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Do you... And some of you might not, but do you remember a shampoo commercial from the 1970s from Fabergé? Where the lady goes, I just love my shampoo. It's great. And so I told two friends. And then what happens? And then they told two friends. And they told two friends. And, the, and they start doing the blocks where it's the same girl really in an irritating way telling you about her shampoo. And it's just, it looks like like three Brady Bunch blocks all, all jumbled together. And it's like, and I told two friends, and I told two friends, because this shampoo is, I guess, it must have been so amazing. Ironic, though, you can't find it on the shelves today. I think if it was the best shampoo ever, it'd still be around, but I, I guess not. I guess not. One person who liked the product shared it with, with two friends, and the people who used the shampoo expanded exponentially. So what if a product like that made a difference in your life? What would you do? Well, you'd share it. Marketing it counts on you sharing it. A reliable brand of car, a favorite coffee, a cable company. We're very open in sharing with someone a product that has made our life easier, where we've truly gotten customer service or where we found a great value, where we've had a good experience. We share that, and, and other people are excited to hear what we have to say. Are we as open with our faith, though, is our question for this morning. What if the good news of Jesus Christ could be seen as something that could be shared like a virus? Well, in our text this morning, we've learned, and we'll go through together, we've learned that it can. Our first thing we want to look at is that viral multiplication works. First, Jesus wanted his followers to be involved because it works. He's not doing this because it's some kind of ancient prophecy that we have to send 70 people out. It is because he knows if he does it this way, he'll get the reaction and the outcome that he wants. The best viral marketers are what Malcolm Gladwell in his business classic book called The Tipping Point. They're called mavens. Mavens are people who can't stop talking about a great new thing. But they're the chatterers whose opinions people trust and follow. Not just someone with a strong opinion, but someone people are like, oh really, well they like this, it must be good. When a maven tells 20 friends you have to try the cinnamon rolls at the corner cafe, 15 of them will try the cinnamon rolls at the corner cafe. When mavens post on Twitter, thousands of people jump on to follow their tweets. The 70 were Jesus' mavens, and he gave them to give to others. Like the the theory of trickle-down economics, Jesus had a relational structure that he invests most heavily at the top. He tends it to work its way down through the multiplied leadership. Peter, James, John were probably the standouts that were used to train the 70 to send them out. And they told two friends, 
and they told two friends, and they told two friends, and so on. Just like a hair care per commercial, but with something far more important. Like leaders and companies that have expanded through viral networking, today Jesus invokes the, the participation of the people who follow his way in spreading his message. He first infects, to keep the viral language going, he first infects his followers with a vision of the kingdom of God. You can find that really clearly in Luke 4 through 9. Now, a little further down in Luke chapter 10, where we're at today, he sends out those who have been infected with a vision of the kingdom of God to infect others. It's viral, and it works. Don't believe me? Well, today, some two billion Christians throughout the world are the evidence that it worked. Can this be bad? I mean, can mavens or people the community trust spread a bad message? What if we vent about our frustrations and we connect those frustrations with our church? Well, that message can go viral too. And anyone who's ever said something without thinking about it and put it on Twitter or Facebook knows all too well the damage that can be done. A juicy negative statement will catch on more quickly than a normal example of something positive. Very few people have their attention gleaned or or caught by something that is just normally positive. And someone sharing a negative outlook while eating at a local restaurant infect those hearing the information with such a powerful message, it will take 20 instances of something positive to change it. 20, one negative statement, perhaps 20 positive, just to put it back on even on an even keel. So if you're frustrated with your church and you go to Bob Evans and you complain about it, it's going to take 20 positive things for your church to do to just get that person back to being neutral in a belief. See, the problem is we're not called to sell our church. This isn't marketing in the same way that we'd market a business. Some of the the tactics we might use could be similar. But the point is our church is filled with human beings. And we're all flawed and sinful and imperfect and in need of grace. What we are called to represent, what we are called to take out with us and share with others, is the experience of encountering Jesus Christ at our church. And the powerful, life-changing possibilities that that holds for someone who's never had that experience or who has walked away from it once. Someone who's struggling with life, in need of a life-altering, life-changing love that can only be found in Jesus Christ. That's what we're peddling, if you want to put it back into marketing terms. That's what we're sharing, is Christ. We may use a logo, we may use a website, we may, you know... Hashtag this or do that about this church. But what we are trying to do, what we are charged to do, what we are called to do is to give hope to the hopeless and to give a life of meaning to someone who's looking just for a reason to get out of bed in the morning. That's Christ. And we encounter that love of Christ here at North United Methodist Church. So our job in the city of Madison in Jefferson County, Indiana, is to go out beyond the walls like we hear every Sunday And to offer that same kind of experience to someone else. So, that's our message that we're called to take into the community. Second, people value things that cost them. Jesus wanted his followers' involvement because people value things that cost them. To see the disciples and what they'd given up lets other people know that this is something that's legitimate. Why is Jesus at odds with things being easy, though? I mean, what's his problem with that? Well, one reason is that we tend to place more value on the things that cost us something. Emory University researchers found that people who had won the lottery, uh, people who had trust funds, uh, people who got their money without having to work for it, they experienced lower satisfaction than people who had to earn their cash. They note that other research shows lottery winners report no change in happiness by one year after their winnings. If you take that initial rush of everything that the lottery winner gets... And then they realize what percentage they have to give back to the government for taxes. And then they realize how many relatives want a piece of it. And then the stress that comes from that new set of criteria, they're actually less happy than before they were playing. Denver Seminary runs a low-cost counseling center. And counseling fees are operated on a sliding scale based on household income. But the minimum fee is $1. The minimum fee isn't just free, it's $1. Because they found over time that even when people had no extra money to live off of, they valued and they participated in their counseling more when there was a cost associated with it. A dollar made a difference in counseling outcomes. 
The point of both examples to you this morning is to show that we value things that cost us. And the message for the 70 that Jesus sent out so many generations ago is the same for a viral church today. When we have some personal cost because of the kingdom of God, because of Christ Jesus, we value it more deeply and we have to buy in and we have to own it. So Jesus is looking for owner operators, not customers in the church. Third, God will use everyone who is willing. Jesus wanted his followers' involvement because God will use everyone who is willing. Verse 2 out of our section today is a classic. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. People often use this phrase to refer to how great the need is out there. But this text, if you look at it really closely, it's about the 70. It's right there with Jesus telling the 70. He's giving them their pep talk, and we are allowed to hear it. I mean, we've all seen those coaches that either have great motivational speeches to their athletic groups or their teams, or they've brought somebody in that's just a fantastic speaker. And we've been privy to some of those with the, either a hidden camera or a special permission given to a cameraman to be in there and record that. And we're just like, that's so exciting that I can apply that to my life. Even though that speech was not given to us. It was given to, to that group of, of men or women to, to go out there and, and give it their all on the field or the court. See, this is what we're, we're doing now is we're seeing what Jesus is telling the 70. And, and, and we're being reminded that, yes, it is still very much a situation where God needs us all to participate for his plan to work out. I guess maybe Jesus is focused on the labor more than the need for labor. But what if there was always a harvest? What if there was always a harvest and there was always an ability, there was always a place whenever, wherever you were willing to serve? What if it was always a need? And I think that's kind of the point of the text. Maybe God chooses to reach only as many people as we're willing to reach with him, though. Wouldn't that be tragic? If we're all just kind of like sitting back, waiting for the person next to us to serve? Or we don't think we're equipped or good enough? We don't think we can make a big difference? We don't have a lot of extra income to to donate? We don't have a lot of extra time? We'll just wait for somebody else to do it. What if, what if God chooses only to reach the people that we are willing to reach for him? Ooh, that one sticks. Sit with that idea for a while. Imagine a church full of kingdom consumers who could have been kingdom expanders. Countless lives of others may remain untouched because Christians aren't willing to go viral, though that would certainly, certainly make them unhealthy to just sit and not go out. Isn't that ironic about this analogy? You're healthy by going viral. (laughs) Finally, we have a richer experience of following God. Jesus wanted his followers' involvement because it gave them a richer experience of following him. When Jesus' viral network came back from their mission trip, we read that the 70 returned with sadness and their feet hurt. No! It said they returned with joy. With joy. Were they thrilled to get home? Tired of living out of a suitcase? Well, no. Jesus told them they couldn't take a suitcase, so they couldn't even have one. Their joy was a direct result of how God had used them. They were just like us at the beginning. They were wondering, how are they going to connect? What are they going to exactly be doing? What's it like, Lord? What's, what's the itinerary of this trip going to be looking like? What time will I be back? When, when, you said I can't wear shoes. Can I wear socks? Can I put something over the balls of my feet so they don't wear out? You know, all these questions. You know, that's what they, they started with. And then once they got into the purpose of what they were doing, the Holy Spirit worked with them and they were able to get it figured out. Did they have bad days? Of course they did. They probably had some doozies. But you know what? They were useful. And there is something wired deep within us that when we are being used for the purposes of Jesus Christ within this creation, there is something that ignites within us. It's like you're designed for this stuff. This is your purpose. And and everything else that just has been a problem doesn't necessarily go away, but it takes a side step. They were excited, and they came back with a deeper infection with Jesus' excitement than they left with, and he hadn't even been raised from the dead yet. 
All they did was went out and they said, the kingdom of God is near. The prayers that you've been throwing at the altar have been, have been heard. You don't have to be a special privileged person for God to understand and love you. Because in the person of Jesus Christ, our Messiah, God has answered our prayers. God has come near. They were so excited that the here and now now had more meaning. And people were excited about that. Then what happens at the end, which is the beginning of the story, when Christ is crucified... When he takes upon himself the weight of the sin of the whole world. And then those people go back out into those villages where they had first said the kingdom of God is near. They said, now let me tell you what this all means. That's where the first churches were started. They weren't necessarily started when the 70 went out. They didn't start new groups and then start creating logos and then say, well, I'm not that version. I'm this version or or whatever. They were like, God has heard our prayer. God has reached out to us. God loves us. Just the sheer possibility of that has changed my life. And then after the resurrection, disciples went out, apostles went out, and they started planting churches in that ripe ground where people had already begun to just think of the possibility that God loved them. Then came the proof in the person of Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross, and what happened on Easter Sunday. Wow. In 1 John, John claims that Bearing witness to Jesus is what makes his joy complete. It's, it's the same idea as when the 70 came back. And it's the same idea when, when you have an experience in your life where you, where you have been used by God. Where you've been on a mission trip or you've, you've had one of those moments where you can just feel the Holy Spirit nagging at your heart and you gave in. That kind of joy is just not something this world really even understands. You know, God's rigged the experience of, of, for his followers. Christianity offers fuller satisfaction only through fuller participation. Let me say that again. Christianity offers fuller satisfaction only through fuller participation. You can't withdraw and do less within the life of the church and in the life of your faith and, and think, wow, God's not listening to my prayer. I don't feel as close to God. The more you put in, the more you get. The more you withdraw, the less you feel. That's the way the faith thing works, is we are designed to be wired together and to God. It's an exciting thing. We've all experienced this at some point. This is the great place to share your stories and receive more than you're given through service and faith sharing. Greater strategy, greater buy-in, greater results, greater experience. And that comes when a church gets committed to fully living the kingdom value of kingdom expansion and sets aside the personal value of personal preferences. Why? See, we may agree that the delivery system works. We may all understand how quickly a tweet can go out through Twitterverse or how quickly a Facebook post can be shared or even how quickly a text can go if we do a group message. We can all agree on that. We can all acknowledge that. We might acknowledge the power of viral technology to spread news, but why should we do this thing we hear in a sermon? Because Christ said to He sent out the 70, and then in the Great Commission, he sends out all of us who will ever live in his name to go into the world and reach the lost. But do we really believe in that stuff? I mean, honestly, do we really still go there? Do we still believe in the lost? Are people lost? In his latest newsletter article titled, Why Our Indiana Bishop of the United Methodist Church, Michael Coyner, writes these words. An absence of sound and clear soteriology causes our churches to become little religious clubs clubs of persons who only want their own needs met, who demand their own preferences, and who are satisfied to sit by and watch other people continue to live their desperately lost lives without faith. He is trying to remind us that eternal souls are at stake, and we tend to become distracted. And there is no greater weapon against the Christian faith than a distracted congregation. Because when we get distracted by things, there are people we then force to live lost lives outside, just outside our reach. Soteriology, it's the fancy term for belief that humanity is lost and in need of salvation. Soteriology is the fancy term that reminds us that all have sinned, fallen short, and are in need of the grace and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. 
Do we really believe that the world, that people in our community are lost without the love of Jesus Christ? Do we really believe that if someone doesn't have Christ in their life, that, 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 that they're just in the darkness? Because if we really believed in the love of Jesus, and we really believed in the need for that love in our community, wouldn't we do things differently? Wouldn't we live differently as people and as a church? Why are we more open to share a brand of deodorant than to share the transforming love of Jesus Christ? I mean, is body odor more critical to us in a society than salvation? But it's how we live. Because we're all broke. We are all shattered pieces trying to figure out how to take our next step. And the point of it all isn't to make us feel like wretched failures. It is to remind us that in spite of being wretched failures, we can be used. We can be useful. And in the process of being used and available, we can be effective. And by being effective, we can infect ourselves and others with the viral message of the kingdom of God that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever shall believeth in him shall not perish but will have life eternal. Those words have to make sense. They can't just be posters at Colts games. Otherwise, why be here? Why traipse through the snow on a, on a cold Indiana morning on a Sunday if that's not real? Why are we more open to other things than to living our faith? Because faith sharing is terrifying. If someone doesn't like the brand of deodorant you suggested, they'll find another of the 20,000 different brands, right? But if someone says, no, I didn't like the way you, you presented Jesus, I'm not really all that interested. Maybe we're just worried about that failure. But friends, we got to be willing to fail because sometimes our failures are that soil that God will use to grow up something fantastic. How many of those 70 failed their mission? How many of those 70 went into a house and someone said, get out of here before I shoot you, right? How many of those 70 had those experiences, but then after the resurrection, when the apostles came back through those same villages, said, I should have believed to begin with, and I'm sorry, I I want to believe now. We have to understand that we're just part of a bigger plan. And sometimes our failures in sharing our faith with someone else are the exact thing that God can use for someone else later to bring someone to Jesus Christ. We can't be so caught up with our success or failure because we have already failed. Otherwise, the cross isn't needed. So we have to be bold and to say, you know what, I'm going to screw up. You know what, I'm going to need grace. You know what, I'm going to need forgiveness. And that's fine because I'm not going to give up. I'm going to start today and I'm going to move forward and I'm not going to stop. The delivery of the good news can operate like a virus. For good, for bad. And are we infecting people in our community with hope? Are we infecting them with confirmation that the church doesn't make a difference? Are we doing nothing at all? What are we doing? What are we doing? Answer that question, then ask, what should we be doing? How are we going to get there? Those are some important questions that we need to ask. Not because we're wretched. Not because we're sinful, although we are those things. But because we are loved. And as we come to terms and we reconnect with that sense of being loved, that emboldens us to be able to go out and share that love with someone else. That is the viral church. That is the healthy church. That is the growing church. Not the church that has it all together, but the church that doesn't wait around to try and get it all together, which will never happen, and goes out anyway, shares anyway, loves anyway. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit.